Hi, pre-Ks. It's so nice to see you. Find a spot you like a lot. One, two, three. Find a spot you like a lot. Listen to me. Find a spot you like a lot. Three, two, one. Find a spot you like a lot. We'll have some fun. The last time I saw you was Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. The last time I saw you was Tuesday. But that's not today. What comes after Tuesday? That's our middle of the week day. Today is Wednesday. Whoa, 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 Wednesday. Whoa, whoa, Wednesday. Smack in the middle of the week. Yes, it's Wednesday. Whoa, 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 Wednesday. A Wednesday smack in the middle of the week. Monday, Tuesday are the beginning of the week. Thursday and Friday at the end of the week. I'm stuck in the middle with you on a Wednesday. I'm stuck in the middle with you on a Wednesday. Oh, we're leaving the terrible teens. Hooray, hooray. When you get to nine, it's mighty fine because magical things start to happen. When you get to nine, it's so divine, a new family starts to happen. So what comes after the number 19? A brand new family. If there's a two in the front seat and a zero in the back seat, two, zero, two, zero, twenty. When there's a two in the front seat and a zero in the back seat, two, zero, two, zero, twenty. It's the twentieth day of what month? I was walking through the park one day, nice weather today, in the merry, merry month of May, M-A-Y, the shortest month with only three letters in it, and a month that goes by quit pretty quickly. Let me tell you, we're already coming to the end of May. We have a party coming up for Memorial Day. In fact, there's no school next Monday. A holiday, no school. Hip, hip, hooray, we love the holidays to talk about Memorial Day, and we'll be doing that on Friday. Now that we're in the 20 family, it's easy breezy again. Now we just count regular by ones. Let's find out what family we're working on today. Mix them up, mix them up. These are the harder families. Mix them up, mix them up, mix them, mix them up. We're gonna mix them high, mix them low, mix them high my back. Mix, 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 mix them up. We're gonna mix, 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 mix them up. Let's see what family is up today. Take a vowel, A-E-I-O-U, and a consonant, all the other letters. Put them together and you've got a family. Just like your family, you take a vowel and a consonant. Put them together. You've got a family, the I and family. The I and family. Let's make some rhymes in the I and family. Put a P there, pin. Put a B there, bin. Put a W there, win. Put a T there, tin. Put an F there, fin. In the I and family. There's pin and bin and win and tin and fin in the I and family. Let's get our flag out. We're gonna be taking a closer look at this flag on Friday for Memorial Day. Take your right hand, put it on your heart and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, this flag, the United States of America where we live and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're talking about those five senses. And we found out that you're so lucky. Me too, we're very lucky. Even though my eyes don't work as well as yours, when I put glass in front of them, then my eyes work perfectly. My ears work, I can hear you. My ears are getting older, so sometimes I have to listen a little bit harder. And my children keep telling me it's time for hearing aids. I don't believe them. But I can get some little tiny earbuds that go into my ear. So I can turn the volume up and hear people better. Oh, my nose is still in great shape, except when it's clogged. My skin, my skin works. I can feel if things are hot or cold or sharp or something hurts my body or feels good. And my tongue, oh yeah, thank goodness my tongue is still working. That ice cream still tastes excellent. And I loved hearing your favorite taste <laughs> in our Zoom meeting on Friday. What do you like best? So we're in good shape. We're very lucky. And if things happen, if you fall off your bike, if you're riding your bike on the driveway and you fall down and you hurt your arm, well, they can put a cast on that. And your muscles, you know what? They will get better and your arm will work again. If you fall down on your trampoline or you get hurt going down the steps, you might have a cast on. You might have a cast like this. 
and this will protect your leg so it can get better. But you will get better. Your body has that ability to fix itself. We even had a little boy in a wheelchair here. True story, a boy broke his leg and he had to come to Pipe Piper in a wheelchair. It wasn't a pink one, but it was a wheelchair like this. And he rode around, and we've had children with wheelchairs before. They can ride around in their wheelchairs. They can push them. They can push them with their hands. Uh, other friends can push them around. And sometimes people can get out of that wheelchair if they feel better, but sometimes they can't. So what we're talking about this week is people whose bodies cannot get better. Something happened, maybe they were born that way, or there was an injury. Something happened that their eyes didn't work anymore, and that's called blind. Their ears, something happened, it could have been injured, or they could have been born that way, and then they are deaf, they cannot hear. Or your vocal cords, your vocal cords are broken, something doesn't work in your throat, and then that's called mute. Or maybe their skin can't tell if it's hot or cold. It can't tell that that hurts or that feels good. That's called neuropathy. Or their tongue doesn't work. They can't tell them flavors. Their tongue doesn't say, oh, that's nice and sweet, or that's sour, or that's too salty, or that's spicy. People whose bodies don't work as well, or their muscles don't work when they try to get up, they cannot. Their arms aren't strong enough. That's called someone who has a handicap. We all have a handicap. Some people are better at writing. Some people are better at skipping. There's always handicaps out there. We're not all the same. And we can usually work hard to overcome our handicaps. But sometimes it's even harder. And we talked about people who are blind and Kathy brought in her stick. We talked about tap, 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 tapping. They use one hand, the stick can fold up, can go in their purse, can go in a backpack. They don't even need to have it out if they're somewhere they're comfortable. But if they're moving around in a new situation, they're gonna tap, tap, tap with a cane. Kathy told you to try to go from your living room to your bathroom with your eyes closed. See how you do. Try to go somewhere safe, don't go near stairs, but try to go from your kitchen to your living room. If it's all on one floor, no steps, with your eyes closed. Then grab something like a stick and try tapping because that's what a blind person would do. Or they could have a seeing eye dog. And we talked about ears that didn't work yesterday. And Kathy said, that's why I use sign language all the time. Because I think it helps you. Sometimes you're not listening. You're not really looking at my mouth. You're not watching what I'm doing. And if I have my hands moving too, that kind of catches your eye. And then you're able to see that I'm, I'm saying the words with my hands as well as with my mouth. And if I ran into someone whose ears did not work and they were deaf, I could use my hands to talk to them. And today we're talking about what happens if you can't talk. If you can't talk, and that can happen too. Because you have vocal cords in your body. These vocal cords move around. They vibrate back and forth, like the strings on a guitar. I brought you that guitar in. This is one of my grandchildren's American Girl doll guitars. Thank you, Gabby. She let me bring in her American Girl doll small guitar. These strings will vibrate. This is just a pretend guitar. My guitar makes real music, but you can hear it. Those sound waves travel in the air and they go into your ear and they bounce against that tambourine skin that makes the bones wiggle, sends a message to your ear. Mommy's calling me. Uh-oh, there's ice cream man. Kathy wants me to sit down. Those vibrations also occur inside your throat. Inside your throat, you have two vocal cords, vocal cords. And those are the things that create the sound that come out of my mouth. And these vocal cords hang inside your throat and they allow you to speak. But what happens if they're broken? Sometimes mine gets sore. And when I try to talk, you've seen Kathy trying to play the piano and nothing comes out or I sound like a frog. Sometimes if I have a cold, they get covered with mucus, like boogers can be on your vocal cords as well. I have to cough <coughs> to get that, to get that off of my vocal cords because my vocal cords are very important to me. They're what go back and forth when I'm singing. They're what go back and forth when I'm talking. But vocal cords can get broken too, or they can get injured just like your ear and your eyes. And people who cannot talk are called mute. And today's story, today's story is about someone born a long time ago. And she was born healthy. 
and she was born able to do things. But then she got very sick. And this sickness that she had, had no medicine. Because remember, this was a long time ago. It wasn't now. And when they tried to make her better, it didn't work. So she stayed sick for a while. And then parts of her body did not work. Her eyes did not work. She was blind. Her ears did not work. She was deaf. And because she couldn't hear the words, she was mute as well. She couldn't talk. But you know what? Despite all these handicaps that this little girl had, she went on to do amazing things. This is a story of young Helen Keller. Let's see what happens to young Helen Keller by Carol Joan Drexler. The baby's cries could be heard all through the house. For days she ran a high fever and then, just as suddenly as it had come, the fever went away. But instead of being her usual active little self, the baby lay in her crib crying softly and not moving very much at all. The doctors had to give Helen Keller's parents very bad news. The illness had left Helen blind. She couldn't see. And deaf, she would never hear again. 19-year-old Helen was suddenly locked inside a dark and silent world where nothing was familiar or comforting. When she was able to be out of bed, Helen didn't want to let her mother's skirt go. She held on to it, for her mother was the one thing in her world that Helen knew and could be sure of. Mrs. Keller was wonderfully patient with little Helen. She'd put Helen's hand on her own cheek, and then she'd nod her head up and down very hard. Helen learned that this movement meant yes, just as she learned to shake her head, back and forth meant no. And a tug of her arm meant come, and a slight push meant go. In the months that followed, Helen learned how to get around the house and up and down the stairs without always bumping into things. But the darkness and silence were very lonely for an active two-year-old girl. It was also difficult that sometimes Helen would run out of patience and have a temper tantrum. She knew she was different from other people around her, and she hated, hated being different. Helen's best friend during those early years was a little girl named Martha Washington. She was the daughter of Helen's cook. Martha how, somehow understood what Helen meant by her different signals. She was always willing to go along with Helen's ideas for games, especially games that weren't such a good idea. One day the girls were sitting and making paper cutouts when Helen got the clever idea that they should cut each other's hair. Both Martha and Helen looked pretty funny and lopsided when their mothers caught them. Helen was very smart and no one knew better than her what she could think of next. One day after the family had moved into a new house, Helen felt a key in the pantry door. By putting her hand over her mother's hand when Mrs. Keller locked the door, Helen quickly learned what a key was used for. The next time Mrs. Keller went to the, Mrs. Keller went to the pantry, Helen turned the key and locked her mother in. When her mother started to pound on the door and shout for help, little Helen could find, feel the vibrations and she sat on the back steps laughing with glee at the mischief she had caused. Helen's temper and naughtiness became really dangerous when her baby sister Mildred was born. Helen, five and a half years old, was used to having her mother's complete attention. She was very jealous of the new baby. When her mother bathed or fed Mildred, Helen would interfere and demand attention for herself. One day, Helen decided to put her favorite doll into her old crib. She ran into the nursery, reached into the crib, and discovered that the baby was already there. With one angry sweep of her hands, Helen, Helen turned that crib upside down, baby and all. Mildred might have gotten hurt if Mrs. Keller hadn't heard the noise and come running in. Something had to be done to help Helen and to teach her. Mr. Keller told Helen that he heard of a doctor, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. They went to see him. He was the very same man who 10 years before had invented the telephone. Mr. Bell, Dr. Bell, specialized in treating deaf patients and had a wonderful talent for understanding and helping them. When Helen came to see him, he took her on his knee and gave her his watch to play with. This kind man told the Kellers about the Perkin Institute for the Blind in Boston and thought the Perkin Institute would have a teacher that Helen could have. In March of 1887, when Helen was not quite seven years old, Ann Sullivan came to live at the Keller's house in Tuscombe, Alabama. From the very moment when the strange new person hugged her, Helen took to her teacher, but she wanted to be the boss in the new relationship. Ann Sullivan understood Helen's feelings and fears, for she herself had been nearly blind, and even now she had poor sight. But she knew that Helen had to learn self-discipline before she could learn anything else. During the first morning together, Miss Sullivan gave Helen a beautiful new doll. She spelled the letters D-O-L-L -L in hand language in Helen's palm. Helen eagerly made the signs herself, but when Miss Sullivan took the doll away from her in order to go on with the lesson, Helen threw one of her famous tantrums. 
Helen quickly learned that her teacher wouldn't give in the way her mom and dad sometimes did. Helen was given back her new doll only when she made the signs D-O-L-L -L, several times. Miss Sullivan and Helen fought the first few weeks. One morning, Miss Sullivan decided to teach Helen some table manners. The Kellers had always allowed Helen to eat any way she wanted to, but when Helen put in her hand a spoon so she could eat her porridge, she got very angry. She threw the spoon and herself on the floor, kicking and screaming in her usual way. Miss Sullivan put Helen back in the chair and put the spoon in her hand. The Kellers left the room, and when Helen discovered that she was alone with Miss Sullivan, she carried on for a long time, but by the end of the morning, a hungry and tired Helen Keller you learned to use a spoon and a napkin. Miss Sullivan convinced the Kellers that she'd do better with Helen if there was no one else around. Mr. and Mrs. Keller agreed to have Miss Sullivan and Helen live in a little garden house, a one-room house right on the property right near her parents. The day they moved into that little house, Helen had an unbelievable tantrum, and it took a week before she settled down to start her lessons again. Miss Sullivan began by spelling simple words into Helen's hands. She'd push Helen into a chair and say, sit, S-I-T, and pull her to her feet and spell stand, S T A. N D or push her gently to move her and spell walk W A L K before two weeks were over Helen had a vocabulary of 18 words even though she didn't fully understand what they meant even more importantly she was calmer and better behaved than she'd ever been for her curious mind had finally found something to think about and do one day Mr. Keller brought the family dog Belle to the garden cottage when Helen sensed and smelled the dog's presence she groped around till she found Belle with her fingers then she hugged and kissed the old setter and picked up one of Belle's paws, touched each claw on it. Miss Sullivan finally realized that Helen was trying to teach Belle a word. She was trying to teach Belle how to spell doll, D-O-L-L, -L, in the dog's paw. One day, about a month later, Miss Sullivan had arrived with some very exciting news. Though she knew a lot of words, Helen had yet understand that each word belonged to something or someone or some action. It was hard for her to try to tell the difference between mug and milk because both were a part of drinking, and she didn't understand that milk was what she drank and mug was what she drank from. On this particular day, she asked what water was called as she washed her hands and face. Miss Sullivan spelled the word out in her hand, W-A-T-E-R, and filled the mug with water and tried to explain which was which, but Helen didn't understand. Miss Sullivan took Helen by the hand and went down to the water pump. She placed Helen's hand under the cold stream of water with the pump and spelled W. A T E R over and over again in Helen's other hand. Then she made Helen hold onto the mug under the spout to catch the water, and she spelled out the word mug, M U G. The feel of the water brought memories when she was a baby, and that sudden memory helped Helen to connect the letters in her hand with the thing itself. Excited, she touched everything around her and made Miss Sullivan spell out all their names. In that one morning, Helen learned 30 new words, but even more importantly, she understood what they meant. By the time she was selling seven, Helen was learning to read and write. She learned reading by using raised braille letters, special letters for blind people that you could feel with your fingertips. And she had as much fun feeling her way through a storybook as sighted boys and girls enjoy reading a storybook. Later that year, the circus came to Cuscomi, and the manager allowed Helen to come before the official opening and touch all the different animals. She touched an elephant's trunk and shook a bear's paw and played with a monkey who stole her hair ribbon and petted some baby lions. Helen had a wonderful time and thought of nothing but animals for weeks afterwards. A few months later, just before her eighth birthday, Helen and Miss Sullivan went to Boston, where Helen became a student at the Perkins Institute. She loved being with children her own age, especially children who read books the way she did with their fingers. Helen studied very hard, and one of the best, she was one of the best students in her class. Helen Keller kept studying and working hard. When she was older, she went to college, and while in college, she wrote a book about her life and how Miss Sullivan had been her teacher and taught her. When she finished school, Helen and her beloved teacher devoted their lives to helping other people who were blind and deaf all over the world. Helen Keller, the little girl who had temper tantrums because she couldn't see or couldn't hear, grew up to be a wise and generous woman who spoke up for the blind and the deaf so that others could hear and help them. What a great story about Helen Keller. We're going to hear more about her tomorrow.